The Pacific Ocean covers about a third of the surface of the Earth. It is dotted with islands that are home to thousands of people. Hello. Countless ocean beauties thrive here. But many Pacific Island nations are now facing a dilemma. Should they exploit their resources or preserve them? In 2012, the Cook Islands set aside an area of the Pacific the size of France and Germany combined and created the world's largest marine park. And now the government is under pressure. Fishermen, miners, and conservationists all claim an interest in the park. If the park is to survive, there must be a balance. So the Cook Islands government must decide where these activities can take place. To solve this massive jigsaw puzzle, a team from the marine park will visit every island in the Cook Islands to get input from the people. And all your questions will go into a database. Team up with scientists to collect data and use sophisticated mapping software to plot management zones within the park. If they can pull it off, they will create a groundbreaking plan that will harness the wealth of the sea and safeguard the ocean like no nation has ever done before. The Cook Islands Marine Park is the brainchild of rugby league champion, Kevin Iro. He spent a lot of his childhood in the Cook Islands, where he grew to love the ocean. At a young age, seven or eight, um, I'd spend every day, you know, in the sea and uh, uh, in the oceans, fishing and uh, out on boats. It just becomes part of you. Kevin wants the Cook Islands to lead the charge for ocean conservation in the Pacific. We should be uh, protecting it and we should be leading by example. A decade ago, we were the first Pacific nation to uh, declare our waters as a, a whale sanctuary. Um, now, the whole Pacific has uh, followed suit. For the last two decades, Kevin was a professional rugby league player. For most of his career, he played away from home. But Kevin returned to the Cook Islands whenever he could. Each time he came back, he noticed alarming changes in the ocean. Fishermen catching fewer fish. Some coral dying. And invasive species moving in. Eventually, he came up with the idea to create the largest marine park on the planet. Really, it drew me to really push the uh, marine park concept, really for future generations. You know, I've got uh, six kids that are, you know, I'd, I'd hope uh, that when they get older and they have uh, kids, that, you know, they'd be able to enjoy the ocean, you know, as much as I did when I was young. Kevin talked to everyone he could about his idea for a massive marine park, and in time, got the prime minister on his side. Within two years, they had drawn an outline of the park. So this would be our, the Cook Islands' uh, actual territorial waters. It's two million square kilometers. And last year, the prime minister announced half of these waters, 1.1 million square kilometers, uh, to be a marine protected area. So this is the main island of Rarotonga. Around about there, you have Aitaki up here and Harmison all by itself out here. The Cook Islands Marine Park spans almost half the nation's ocean territory. It covers a million square kilometers of Pacific Ocean. 
It contains spectacular wildlife, like sharks, manta rays, and thousands upon thousands of fish. In parts, it plunges over six kilometers down. It is a vast expanse of ocean, earmarked as a marine park. Prime Minister Henry Puna approved the park boundary. For him, the marine park is a link to the past. In many ways, we are people of the ocean. Our forefathers, you know, would travel the oceans far and wide, and that's how our islands were settled, by seafaring people. And our respect for the ocean is born out of that long history. He believes the park will be vital for Cook Islanders in the future. We need to show respect for the ocean because whether we realize it or not, it sustains life on this earth. Millions of years of evolution have shaped marine ecosystems into complicated natural systems that support thousands of creatures. But these systems are very sensitive to human impact, and across the world, many are beginning to decline. If it's looked after properly, this huge park can supply all the shelter and food predators and prey need to thrive. And in turn, these ocean creatures will provide people with income from fishing and tourism. It's a holistic view of conservation supported by Toru Ariki, the president of the Cook Islands traditional leaders. We believe that we need to take care of every species that is inside our ocean, especially for the generation to come. So far, the government has only defined the outline of the park. Now, they must decide where business can take place inside the park. And the situation is urgent because three groups want to stake their claim in the park. So there are competing interests within the Cook Islands Marine Park boundaries, and those are obviously fishing, mining. You know, then you've got um, those who, who want to conserve and uh, protect our environment. Um, not to mention, you know, tourism is a, a massive industry in the Cook Islands and um, makes up probably 70% of uh, our GDP. Plotting the areas where each of these activities can take place without harming the marine park is an enormous challenge. The traditional leaders want to create large conservation zones by closing commercial fishing for 100 miles around each island. But commercial fishermen want to fish throughout the park, except for a small 12-mile buffer zone around each island. And deep-sea miners want to exploit minerals found on the seabed. Right now, the minerals lie under 6,000 meters of seawater. They look like small, round potatoes scattered across the seabed. It takes specific conditions to grow these mineral blocks, called nodules. First, they need extremely deep water. Next, they require small pieces of natural material to sink down from the shallows and currents to sweep through the area. And the final ingredient is time. Lots of it. These nodules only grow at about a millimetre per million years. This nodule's about uh, 20 millimetres wide in diameter, so that's about 
you know, around about 10 to 20 million years old. The nodules contain valuable minerals used to manufacture TVs, cell phones, and computers. They contain manganese and iron, and they also contain percentages of cobalt, copper, nickel, titanium, um, vanadium, and metals called rare earth elements. There's enough here in these oceans to supply the world for hundreds of years. But the mining industry might leave a legacy that could destroy the marine ecosystem. Since deep sea mining is relatively new, the government recently created a department to find out what the impact will be. My role uh, is to establish and implement the regulatory framework for seabed minerals in the Cook Islands. We have riches in fisheries and we have riches in seabed minerals. Uh, so it's just a matter for the Cook Islands of converting that uh, wealth into a bank account. But cashing in on the deep sea minerals is fraught with unknowns, and environmentalists already fear the worst. And one of the concerns that I had is to consider what techniques are best to harvest this resource at the, in the deep sea. It needs to be managed and not wasted like some other countries have wasted their um, minerals wealth and they've been left in a worse state. And you could say they should have left their minerals where they were. If it's going to harm the Cook Islands, then we shouldn't do it. Maintaining the fragile ecosystem must come first. But it might be possible to have some commercial business in the park, too. To see exactly where the competing interest groups overlap, Kevin enters a map of where they each want to work into software called a Geographic Information System, or GIS for short. Each map makes a layer in the GIS. First, a map of fishing areas. Next, where the traditional leaders want to set up conservation zones. And at the bottom, the mining hotspots. The GIS stacks up the map layers and makes it easy to see where the interest groups may collide. The beauty of a GIS tool like SeaSketch is that you can see all these layers individually and then on top of each other on the program. You can also add in here uh, any scientific information um, as we collect it in terms of our coral research. Any geographic information Kevin gathers will go into the GIS as a new map layer. And Kevin is about to get a lot more information. He has been tasked, along with the Cook Islands Marine Park Steering Committee, with finding out what the people of the Cook Islands think about plans for using the new park. I know it's a very difficult exercise, but you know, when you base your uh, consultations on the broad sector of the community, uh, and we have the support of our traditional leaders and, and, and the whole range of uh, our society uh, behind this project, then uh, it becomes easy. Uh, because, you know, it's based on what people say and what they want. So now, Kevin and the committee must travel to all the remote islands to hold public consultations. They have one year to collect the people's input. They are heading for Palmerston Atoll. The GIS suggests this may be a problem area. To get there, Kevin's team joins the research ship, Golden Shadow. On board, a group of scientists from the Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation are also going to collect information that will go in the GIS. The researchers will dive hundreds of times, surveying Palmerston's coral reefs and gathering data about each species they see. One coral that we're looking for that we haven't seen yet. Chief scientist 
Dr. Andrew Bruckner hopes to create an underwater map of the island and add a new layer to Kevin's GIS of the marine park. The team journeys for nine hours at sea. Finally, Palmerston comes into view. Yeah, well, we're getting there. It's up around the corner this way. Yeah, out here we have the beautiful island of Palmerston. And my first time here, really didn't realize how big the actual lagoon is and how far it stretches you know, to all the atolls. And it's just an awesome, awesome place. Toru Ariki head of the Cook Islands traditional leaders feels the importance of the mission. I really appreciate it. The way the, the mayor and his council members and also the elders of the island accepted us to bring this new uh, initiative, which is the Malin Path, to the island of Palmerston. The Palmerston Islanders welcome the scientific team to their island home. The research and consultation begin with a blessing ceremony. For Toru Ariki, it's confirmation that the mission is worthwhile. So we are coming here to hear your voice. We're not coming here to tell you what you're going to do. For Dr. Bruckner, it's a chance to thank the people for allowing him to gather data that will eventually help plan the marine park. And so I would just like to really just express my gratitude again to everyone here for inviting us here and um, look forward to being able to share some of our findings with everyone here. Thank you. Kevin and the committee set out on a door-to-door -door journey around the island. We're doing a survey. We're testing a program called Sea Sketch. It allows us to show you all the maps, mm -hmm. all the information, but then it also allows you to ask questions. So every individual in the Cook Islands, we want them to have a say about how they think we should be managing uh, the Cook Islands Marine Park. And what do you think about the Azawariki plan? It's a good plan. Yeah. Uh, if you could make your own zones, yeah, where would they be? I want to go 200 miles out. Yeah? Yeah, well, we can of do that. Of course I will do that. Each day, Kevin and the team explain where conservation or commercial business could occur. It's best to be bigger, but... And the islanders bounce back ideas about where they would like to see each activity take place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, the mining people, uh, the nodules are so deep that they're saying they can come up with um, technology that won't, is not going to disrupt anything when it comes up. But, you know, I can say the same thing to you. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. don't even know if it's true or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Thank you, Mama. You usually find when you do your public consultations, a lot of the elders get up and have uh, something to say. But this one's just a basic, yeah. Whereas the younger generation feel a little bit intimidated or shy. That's Palmerston, then it's the little island. Uh, so, you know, they don't really get up and have their say or ask their questions. So uh, with the Sea Sketch program, they're able to ask questions, they're able to uh, give us feedback and, and able to draw their own zones certainly information I know that the Prime Minister is uh, very keen to get hold of. Too much time, if you feel differently, you want to edit your drawings or whatever, you can do that. Although there are only 63 inhabitants on Palmerston, it will take Kevin and Toru Ariki several days to collect everyone's comments. 
At the same time, the scientists work from the ship just offshore. They will collect all the information they need to create an accurate map of Palmerston's coral reefs. These reefs have never been charted before, and the new map will be a crucial layer in the Marine Park GIS. The researchers split into groups, each tasked with recording different information. Some swim along a line, taking note of species that live on the bottom. Others measure the size and record the health of the corals. One group makes notes about which fish live on the reef. And another collects sand and rock samples. Jeremy Kerr and Sam Perkis are the map-making team. They use a video camera and a global positioning system, or GPS. They record exactly what is on the seabed at each precise location, taking note of the depth, too. They do this hundreds of times around the island, collecting the data they need to build an accurate map. Back on board the research ship Golden Shadow, Jeremy Kerr enters the information. To make the new map, he pulls down special satellite images of Palmerston. Passing over the Cook Islands, the satellite records sunlight as it reflects off the sea floor. Sand, coral, or seagrass all reflect light differently and create a unique color signature on the satellite image. It's almost like a jigsaw of different colors and shapes that with each color representing a different habitat. Jeremy assigns each distinct color on the satellite image to a type of habitat he has seen on the sea floor. Then a computer algorithm divides the entire image into shapes based on their color and creates the complete map. Finally, Jeremy adds the new map to the Geographic Information System, or GIS, and connects the data from the other scientists. It allows us to tie all the information gathered by all the different scientists uh, together into one position on the Earth's surface. It adds up to vital information for planning the Cook Islands Marine Park. But this subject tonight is very important for us to know. On their last night on Palmerston, Kevin and his team have one final chance to tell people about the Marine Park and get their thoughts on how they would like to see it used. We need to start protecting what we have. Uh, industries moving in, we need to know, one, that the environment for a start that we have in our waters is not going to be ruined, but two, that, uh, you know, the resources are going to be used and, uh, you know, and they're, and they're going to be used well. I respect your recommendation. By the end of the evening, almost everyone on the island has had their say. Thank you for coming to us and uh, delivering this concept. The people living on Palmerston depend on the ocean. And the house, put it on the top, ready for the food to go in. The ocean is an extension of our islands. What happens to our, our oceans affects our island and our survivability on these islands. For the people of Palmerston, the government's conclusion on how to manage the marine park is more than just a decision. It will have a real effect on how they live their lives each day. Not only just my children, but my grandchildren, but my nieces, my grandnieces, my grandnephews, they will enjoy the pristine nature that we have in a place like Palmerston. The team head back to the capital, armed with the coral reef maps and the islanders' views to present to the prime minister.
I believe, you know, went really well. Firstly, it gave uh, the people of Palmerston an uh, overall idea of what we were trying to achieve or what the Marine Park is trying to achieve. And to be able to say, this program's here for you at any time. Kevin takes the GIS to show the Prime Minister. It was an excellent uh, way to show people, and, but then an even better way to get their views back and have that all logged into this program. So we need that sort of information. Uh, the quicker, the better. By using the GIS, the comments from the public consultation are connected to a location on the planet. The Prime Minister can see exactly where or if people want to see activities like mining and fishing. I like the idea of the marine park. I don't want a foreign boats to take our fish away. The message I would send to the Prime Minister is that definitely I am in support of the marine park and the no-take fish zones. I'm convinced that it's an essential step that we need to take. The geographic information system will make it easy for the government to define how to use the marine park and has already shown that people on the Northern Islands want to be included in the park too. If the government zones it wisely, the park could be a lasting vital asset. It could provide for all Cook Islanders for hundreds of years. It's ensuring that there is a future uh, in the oceans for our people. You know, at the end of the day, we can create a completely sustainable marine park on a massive scale. You know, I'll be satisfied, very satisfied. And, you know, I hope that uh, other Pacific countries, you know, follow suit and we're actually looking at trying to protect our resources for future generations. It's the kind of lasting protection that dedicated conservationists strive for. If we don't commit ourselves to something like this, uh, what are we going to leave behind? What did we leave behind for our generation to come?